afternoon and welcome to the 19th meeting of the, the Justice Subcommittee on Policing for 2017. Apologies have been received from Mary Fee, which is why I'm chairing today's meeting in her absence. Agenda item number one is an evidence session on Police Scotland's custody provision, which the subcommittee agreed um, to have an evidence session on in order to be better informed about uh, this important use. Also, to enable key stakeholders to express their views about current custody provision um, on the record. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome to the committee today Chief Superintendent Gary McEwen. Pete White, National Coordinator, Positive Prison, Pro Positive Futures. Callum Steele, General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. And Michelle McHardy, Unison Police Staff Scotland Custody Lead. Can I thank the, the witnesses for their written submissions? These are always tremendously helpful to the committee to receive these before actually our formal evidence session. We now move to questions. And can I start by asking Police Scotland if they could outline in very general terms when and why a person may be taken into police custody? Mr McKim. Certainly I can, convener. Thank you. So the, the current legislation, and that's why I may have to jump between the current legislation and the new legislation when the Criminal Justice Act comes in on the 25th of January of next year, but someone will be brought into police custody on two or maybe three different aspects. One is detention. So there is no evidence to substantiate an arrest at that point, but there is reasonable grounds to infer that that person may or may not have committed a, a crime that's punishable by imprisonment, and they can be brought into police custody for a period of detention that will enable police investigation and police interview. So there's that aspect. Another aspect is when there is a sufficiency of evidence to street arrest. So there is, you know, corroborative evidence, other forensic evidence, which then enables a straight arrest of that individual. And he or she will be brought into police custody, and a determination will be made whether that individual should be kept for court, cost and charged, and or released for summons or bail undertaking. And the third main one is by means of a voluntary attendance. So there are individuals where they may actually take it upon themselves to voluntarily attend a police station to give an account, a version of events, and they'll be booked in under a voluntary attendance, and then they will embark, or we will embark upon an interview with those individuals. So that's the three key elements off the top of my head that we would bring people into custody. And, and why would they be detained? So the, the, <clears throat> the detention would be to enable police interview or to gather other evidence, which might be, for example, if there was a, a domestic incident in a dwelling house, you may detain one or both of the suspects for a period of time take them to the police station, which would then allow you, or the officer, sorry, to maybe do some door-to-door -door inquiries or to try and seek and get other witness statements. And then thereafter, the, any evidence or information that they glean through their further inquiries, they would then embark upon a, a recorded tape-recorded or notebook-recorded interview with the suspect within the police station. Um, would there be a high level of maybe health issues in, included in why someone was detained, perhaps if it was a certain type of behaviour? The so we average roughly or currently about 150,000 people that we bring into police stations. Three years ago it was 202,000, but it's now roughly about 150,000. I would say, and the, these are people that declare mental health and or acute alcohol or addiction <coughs> services. 68% of those 150,000 have declared or intimated that they have mental health, vulnerability, suicidal tendencies, addiction uh, requirements. Yeah, that, that's helpful because we understand that these are very often the first responders to, to people with these types of um, health problems and other behaviour. Um, perhaps um, anyone else to add anything to the, the custody? No, that's fully explained. Perhaps I could ask Police Scotland, if there is a difference between week weekend opening facilities, as described in the standard operating procedure, and contingency centres, as described in its written, written evidence, there is. So there's there's three or four key types of centres. One is a primary centre, as we would describe it, and a primary centre 
is a, a custody centre that's open 24/7, seven, seven days a week. An example would be Inverness is a is a primary centre. Kitty Brewster is a primary centre. Kirkcaldy, Dunfermline. So we have 35 of those across the country. We have 45 and sorry, 46 ancillary centres. And ancillary centres are they tend to be in the more remote areas across the country, where a person is detained, arrested, or attends on a voluntary, and they are open for a period of time to enable the investigations that I've described to you. So they're not open full time, they're only open when they're required, and the contingency centres are shut almost all the time, with the exception of you know, perhaps a, a major event or a, a significant a disturbance or march or very very proactive inquiries that requires us to open the contingencies, but they are that that takes place in in very very extreme circumstances. I suppose I'm asking because um, when these these centres were looked at in April 2013, uh, then there were 42 primary. 55 ancillary, six contingency centres representing a whole, uh, uh, a total of 103. And somehow in the, the change of name, the weekend, we seem to have dropped um, by about 18. Would, would that, would there be an explanation for it? Yep, uh, there's a, a number of reasons why we've reduced the estate. One is the demand that I talked about. So in 2013, we had 202,000 custodies coming through the, the custody centres. We now roughly have about 140,000. So, you know, 60,000 less people. So when there's less demand, best value demonstrates uh, for me that we have to review our estate to ensure that we're not keeping certain centres open when they're not required to do so. They, there are other reasons, however, Stirling's a good example where health and safety reasons we've had to shut Stirling. Uh, the, the, the fire didn't comply recently with fire regulations as well as health and safety, so we took the decision to, to shut that and use Falkirk, which is the the co-joining centre used that for the 24-7 rather than the other way about. What we also do, you, you talk, convene around weekend centres. So we, we keep the primary centres open 24-7, but our biggest demand period, not surprisingly, is at weekends. So we have a number of weekend centres that we open just for that purpose. So a good example would be Leavenmouth and Fife, where we have two primary centres, Kirkcaldy and Dunfermline, and that matches the demand required Monday to Friday. But then the Saturday, Sunday, it gets busier. So we open Leavenmouth. We do the same in, in Dundee, where we have Perth and Dundee open Monday to Friday, or all seven days. And then we open Arbroath on the Saturday and Sunday, because that's when peak demand. So it's really about looking at demand and, and keeping our estate and opening new estate when, the de when demand requires it. OK, and um, no other views about um, the weekend contingency and the drop on numbers? Alan yep. Steele. Yeah, th thank you, Convener. Yes, the, uh, a, a slightly different view, not, not, not one entirely uh, contradicting the, the evidence of uh, Mr McEwan, but I, th I think we can't ignore the reality of th that, that many of these decisions that were taken as a consequence of a lack of staff. And the reason we have a lack of staff is because there was a requirement to save money. And because we had to save money, an awful lot of staff were paid off and their posts were made redundant. So we had, we had that kind of Hobson's choice of keeping facilities that we had no people for or whether we were prepared to pay for, pay for people that we didn't necessarily have the custodies for. So one of, the, one of the inherent complexities of custody and custody facilities is that you don't always know when you're going to have people in them. But it's also a requirement in many cases that you have to have members of staff just in the off chance that you have people in them. Uh, and using what I consider to be fairly crude economics, uh, the decision was taken that if you couldn't evidence that there was a member of staff required for the entire duration of the period of work, then the facility wasn't required or the member of staff wasn't required. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just as simple as looking at the head count and throughput of, of bodies, if you like, for, for, for lack of a general term. There, mm -hmm. there was... You know, when the service came into being, the phenomenal pressure to save money did result in the loss of a huge number of staff, which I suspect my colleague to my, my wife will confirm. Uh, and that, in turn, had a knock-on uh, uh, impact on, the, on where uh, facilities were going to be open. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And I think there was some evidence when we, looked, we saw the budget stuff that perhaps that was counterproductive if it was resulting in police having to travel a, a very long distance, the time, all of that in, in, in tales. Um, if we could move on. John Finney, um, you've got a supplementary. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much for your evidence. Uh, a question for yourself, Chief Superintendent McEwen, and per per perhaps the other panel members. And it is about the, the challenge there is for the police. I mean, you know, finance is an important factor, and I think it would be wrong to, to, to say that it doesn't impact across the public sector. But policing is different. In fact, we always hear policing is different, and it's not as simple as supply and demand. Um, and just to be parochial, if I may, Convener, you know, if I, if I look at Cluster 3, so the Highlands and Islands, with one primary, now, Highland Council area alone, never mind the three island areas, is the size of Belgium. Can you help me understand the implications? And I obviously don't want to ask a question or say anything that would make any of our officers out there vulnerable in any way. But, you know, um, if, if someone requires to be locked up in Wick or Fort William, what happens? And it's a Tuesday night. OK, so, so I mean, to, to police the, the north is absolutely uh, unique geography-wise compared to the more urban and rural areas of the Central Belt and the West. The reality is we have, or in Cluster 3, there is one primary centre, which is Inverness, and then as per the, the, the briefing note that was supplied, there are a number of other ancillary stations. So what happens, for example, if in Aviemore, so that's the third line down, so if there's a police officer working in Aviemore and he or she locks somebody up, they are taken to Aviemore Custody Centre. There are no custody staff there, and, and neither should there be, because the, the chances of somebody being locked up in Abbey Moor is relatively infrequent. So the local policing staff there are responsible for opening up the custody centre and doing what needs to be done around safe search and, and assessment, and then they link in directly to the sergeant who's in Inverness via the telephone and give a, the, the update around the, the 21 risk questions that you've seen. Then there's a decision that has to be made. So the decision which I think is the right one, you may disagree, is if that individual is going to be kept for court, we can do one of two things. We can t keep the two local policing officers off the front line in Abbey Moor, uh, ensuring the, the, the care and welfare for that custody for up to 24 hours or over the weekend for three days. That would mean two local policing officers off the street. Or we could make the other decision, which is, we transfer that custody because we know he or she's going to court, let's say on the Monday. We transfer that custody to Inverness, which will take up to an hour and a half, perhaps. And then the custody gets taken there, and then the two officers are then freed up to return back to Aviemore to continue serving the local community. So that's the that's the practice that we do it. There are There is one, so that's local policing. There are significant uh, savings there for local policing officers rather than looking after the custody for 24 hours. But the second part, which for me is actually the most important, is the custody, because that custody may have acute health needs and the only footprint that we have in the north around health care provision is in Inverness. So that's where the nurses are. So we need to take these custodies to Inverness to make sure they get the necessary health care provision that's required. If I may press you on this one, um, uh, Aviemore is probably the nearest centre with the exception of, of near to Inverness. So that, that, that was a... A, a, a story, a, an example where you know the turnaround is quick. I, I purposely chose Wick, you know, up two two plus hours away, yep. and it, it, I'm trying to understand the impact on some of the decisions because everyone wants the best possible custody fa uh, facilities. And in a previous career, uh, I did health and safe, safety inspections as Mr Steele did, of, of premises, and we wanted the very best. So there's no debate, everyone wants that, and they want health care. But, you know, you don't need to travel to get health care. Health care can be local. And it's the extent to which a policy that's imposed, or a, a, a entirely well-meaning, what implications it has for, for operational policing. Because if we take it to be Portree or Wick, then you're talking about the officers being away for several hours. So I agree with that, that but the premise is the same. So you lock somebody up in WIC, if there is an early indication that that individual is unlikely to be kept for court and is going to be detained and interviewed for maybe two hours, then the custody sergeant in Inverness will make the decision to retain that custody there and to allow the local policing staff in WIC to do that investigation. 
If, however, that individual is going to be kept for court for up to 24 hours or three days, then, in my view, we make the right decision to convey that individual to Inverness, which might take four hours or five hours, but there, there and back, I mean, but thereafter that frees up the local policing officers to get back to work, getting back doing what they should be doing, which is looking after local communities and providing a policing service. Indeed, and, and these, these two officers, um, are, are their positions backfilled? to use the term, when they are conveying this person to? No. But the reality is, in a police station, if the, if the custody is retained in WIC, the police officers have to remain within the police station, so they're not there responding to calls anyway. So the best solution for me is to allow that abstraction for the four hours, but then they're back in their local communities, back providing the service. And I, I, I don't mean to, to labour labour the point, but you know the healthcare provision that you know that figure of 68% of all custodies, and they're the ones that declare their healthcare and the acute needs and vulnerabilities they have. They need to be very as, as close, in my view, as they possibly can to healthcare provision. And the healthcare provision in the north is in Inverness and Kitty Brewster. So for me, that's where we should be putting the, the majority of the custodies. Well, but, but the point is that's where the police health care is, but there's health care everywhere across the north of Scotland, uh, and it would be. I, I think colleagues will, will, will pick up on that. One final connected with that, if I may. Um, um, police officers are very pragmatic. They have to make decisions, important decisions regarding depriving someone of their liberty, exercising their very important power, their most important power of discretion. Has there been any assessment made of the impact of any operational decisions? Have Because, you know, it, it, it might cause someone to think, it's a lot of hassle here. I'm going to be away for five hours transporting someone um, to lock them up. I mean, has there been a downturn? I mean, we want to see the minimum number of people um, being detained in police custody, but we most certainly want to see everyone who should be detained in police custody detained in police custody. If you get the balance that I'm... Um, has there been an assessment of that? Uh, no, it's a difficult one to assess that. Uh, you know, if the suggestion is that people are not... The cops on the, the, front, the front line are not taking the appropriate action... I, from my operational experience and, you know, just genuinely speaking to officers, I would be wholeheartedly surprised, to say the least, if they are not locking up the right people because they're, they're fearful that it may mean a, a journey to a, a nearby custody centre. And that's never been suggested to me. I don't know if Mr Steele would like to... Human nature is what human nature is, convener. Um, we, I mean, we have these kind of discussions regarding other elements of policing since the services come into being. The question was, you know, what's the target culture creating an, a, a, an approach to encouraging stop and search? Service was saying no. Uh, we were saying that they were making stuff up, and there was this merry-go-round of denial. And human nature is what human nature is. It's not necessarily whether they're going to be travelling huge distances, which they do in many, many instances, and Wick and Vernes, Portree and Vernes uh, is one of them. But actually, the more difficult area is not the fact that they are travelling long distances, which is, which is a problem. Uh, for reasons that uh, I actually think Mr McEwen only began to touch on, because if you have care issues, then those care issues must continue to prevail even though you're in a vehicle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think the vehicle is the most appropriate setting for delivering care and health to an individual. <coughs> but some of the biggest problems come from actually the delays at custody centres. Uh, and it, it can take very long lengths of time to get people in the door in the first place. So if... if Yet the normal turnaround, and let's, I'm, I'm going to be glib here, but let's say the normal turnaround time was from locking someone up to lodging them in a cell was half an hour, and it's now taking an hour and a half. Well, that's three more custody. That's, that's, that's a third reduction in the custodies you could have had on an, on an ordinary night. So that kind of thing has an impact and a bearing uh, on, uh, on these kind of things. But I actually think that until we start to look at the abstraction of police officers as a loss and as a cost, and actually, the, 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 the fact that communities are losing much more than the fact that there aren't people in their communities when these things are taking place. It's not about being out there and looking after the custody. We should actually not be looking at police officers coming off the seat or transporting them at all. We should have what we used to have, police PCSOs to undertake the kind of activity that was, that was previously understood. But because we adopted this quite idiotic approach to identifying uh, jobs and saying, well, that is your job, therefore that is what you do, without recognition that ma and many people in many roles undertook a whole variety of other ancillary duties, uh, we lost members of staff that were doing an awful lot more than just what their primary job title suggested they were doing. Uh, and that in its own right is a big, big problem. Um, the, the issues uh, of uh, 
you know, human nature and the, the disinclined or being uh, disinclined to lock people up. I think it's you know it's it's a, it's an inevitability. Uh, police officers don't like being idle, and I don't use the term idle. Uh, glibly here, uh, but sitting for a long length of time with a custody, getting impatient when they know there's an awful lot going on and they could perhaps be doing something else, is of course going to discourage people from uh, locking people up. I'm not saying they're neglecting their duty, uh, but these things play out into public perceptions. If people are on the streets creating disorders and they're not being seen to be getting taken away, uh, or the consequence of taking someone away that is creating a disorder is that there is a diminished police presence for a longer length of time than would once have been the case, then that's got to be understood from a public confidence perspective as well as the care of the custody perspective. Before we move on, both uh, Rona Mackay and I are turning to the old firm again, and certainly there was certain behaviour there where the police officer would have to take the decision. Was this someone that you know, really had to be locked up there and then because they were going to go on and cause major problems? Or would a warning suffice, they would settle down, and that would not take the police officer away from where they were needed um, to police the rest of the, the game. So we do understand that these um, these decisions have to be taken, and if there's process of a very long journey and hours off, then that's another factor. Rona. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, I'd like to ask the panel, and if I may, I could, could I start with Eunice and with Michelle, please? Mm -hmm. um, are you satisfied that there are enough custody centres across Scotland to deal with the current demand? And is there a case to be made for an overall reassessment of provision? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, is there enough for demand? At the weekends, when we open the centres, yes. I think during the week, we sometimes struggle. We are moving a lot of our PCSOs around, um, particularly in the West area, um, so they don't have a base station anymore. Um, but that's primarily down, and the crux of this matter is down to staffing levels. We do not have the number of PCSOs that we require to run the centres that we've got. Um, the budget has been cut to such an extent that when PCSOs have left the organisation, through whatever reasons they've chosen to leave, um, they've never been replaced. Um, can I, sorry, can I just stop you? Just um, for clarity, so does a police officer apply to become a PCSO? How, how does that work? No, they're usually appointed to work in custody division to backfill okay. um, for a gap. Right, right, okay, thank you, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, you know, we're having police officers being taken off the front line <laughs> um, doing a PCSO function alongside us it has been until recently on an ad hoc basis we've had um, agreement that there'll be police officers seconded to custody division whilst they look at the structure but we are mm. needing to get the balance right so we can run with the centres without moving staff about okay thank you Callum would you like to You've kind of covered it a wee bit in what you said already. Yes, indeed. I mean, mm. the, the issue of reduction of PCSO is this one, which is particularly difficult. It, it, it's, I, I, I think it's uh, it's been encouraged, maybe it's, it's tolerated, probably is, is the, the, the correct word, rather than encouraged, where the abstraction of police officers is not seen as a cost. Uh, where, however, because support staff and PCSOs were an identifiable line in a budget uh, and their salaries, the loss of PCSOs through either VR or ER, uh, voluntary or early retirement, was was considered a financial saving without recognising that there was a, f a financial cost in terms of time uh, in backfilling the roles, the, 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 the vacancies that were created by, by the absence of CC PCSOs. And as I uh, identified in my submission uh, to this committee on the financial uh, planning uh, just a, a few weeks ago, there have been a large number of reductions in the number of PCSOs. Uh, and even though there are, and I genuinely uh, welcome the developments of this, even though there are proposals uh, to recruit up to about 50 of them just in, in the very near future, that still leaves a huge uh, uh, deficiency in terms of capacity for the people that need to work in these areas. And it's only when uh, the service looks at the cost, and I, I, I talk about this subject regularly, understands the true cost of policing from a holistic perspective rather than from a line, single line budget perspective, uh, will, they be, will we be better placed to, uh, to, to deal with, the, to deal with the, the issues that present us? But in terms of the specific question as to whether we have enough custody centres, I think the short answer to that is no. Uh, we are a contingency service. Uh, 
Uh, and there is, it's been said by so many people that there, is, there are no set of circumstances that you, ca you can't seek to define the kind of circumstances that police officers are, will deal with. And there's, there, are, there is always a benefit. And the consequence of having the benefit is that there's a cost. But there's always a benefit in having a custody facility in as many locations as is possible for the occasions when police officers need to take someone into custody. Self-evidently, coming from my part of the world, there used to be police stations in Lachboistel, Bimbekil, Alachmari, Barra. Uh, you're not going to keep people overnight in these facilities unless you absolutely have to. Uh, but it was still better to have facilities at your local station where you were able to go and do the thing you had to do and then get out as quickly as you possibly could. Uh, in denuding the custody estate, then much more time is taken in dealing with things that used to be done quicker. And that is inefficient. And that is not effective. And that does not save money. OK, thank you. Mr White, do you have any comment on the number of custody stations? Um, no, I don't, I'm afraid. Okay. I, I, That's um, fine. Don't, no, no, I don't, you don't have, have to. <laughs> That's fine. Mr McEwen? Yeah, uh, firstly, for the avoidance of doubt, just to pick up on Callum's point, no PCSOs have ever been afforded voluntary redundancy or early retirement. So uh -huh. just to get that, that clarity there, because you know, somebody might be watching this, so PCSOs have not been allowed that. The PCSO posts that have left is through resignation or retiral, not through voluntary redundancy. Mm -hmm. In relation to the... The custody centres, I genuinely believe we do have enough custody centres and, you know, I suppose it's maybe worthwhile to put it in perspective in, you know, the, the north of Scotland, there, there has been since 2013 three centres that have been shut. So Bucksburn, which was is 2.6 miles from K Kitty Brewster, Loch Maddy and Malague. Loch Maddy is 18 miles from Ben Bekula and Malague is 40 miles from uh, Fort William. So that's three centres that we have. Yep. But what we have left in that area in Cluster 3 is, I think, just from counting that, about maybe it looks about 15 or 16 custody centres. Mm -hmm. So in total, since 2013, we have shut 18 as was my as per my submission, but I would not shut a custody centre if I did not think we had a sufficiency of centres and cells across the country to, to manage the demand. The, the Criminal Justice Act, when that comes in in, the, in January of next year, and Lord Carlyway's presumption of liberation, I predict, albeit you can never predict the future, we'll see a significant reduction again in the number of custodies that we hold and have, <coughs> excuse me, have in our centre. So for me, it's about delivering the best value for the public purse, mm -hmm. the, the safety mechanisms in place and the care and welfare and, and vulnerability plans for these vulnerable people and holding them in the bigger centres where the healthcare provision is. And Mr Finney's point earlier, just around the police healthcare provision, that is not my healthcare provision, that is the National Health Service healthcare provision, and it's them that provide it just within our mm -hmm. custody centres. Sure. So to answer your question, I do think that we have enough custody centres in place, yeah. and if I didn't, I would be making real uh, positive uh, and strong arguments to the executive to say otherwise, but I don't see the need at this time. Okay. Can I go on, please, and ask you, uh, as a panel, um, if you are confident that the custody centres that, that we do have are fit for purpose, and I'm asking because I was quite struck by the concerns in the Unison and SPF submissions about human rights um, uh, impact, and I wonder if you wanted to comment on that, and, and just in general things like, you know, do the centres have translation facilities? Um, you know, uh, healthcare professionals we've talked about, um, and do you th are they subject to any form of inspection, or is it just there's a room, that's where you go, or, is, or do they have to have certain, you know, criteria? Yeah, there's a number of different criteria. So uh, w the size of the cell has to fall in line with Home Office guidance. So if we build any more custody centres now, there has to be a minimum requirement around the size of the cell, etc., which was never in in place before. We have the independent custody visiting service, which is uh, in through the SPA and the visit centres across the country day and night and they are very, very active. And I, I did read somewhere recently that they visit on average nine people, nine custodies per day every year. So, you know, it's many hundreds of people that they're visiting. We have the HMICS. They did a, a full thematic inspection of custody provision in 2014. And now every time they do a, a 
an inspection of a local policing division. We have 13 of them. They bolt on an inspection in relation to custody. They've just finished doing it in Dundee. They've done it in St. Leonard's and Edinburgh, and they do it across the country. We get recommendations and improvement actions that come from there, but I can say with absolute confidence that the thematic, every recommendation has now been complete, and we are still working on the odd improvement action, but we you know, listen to what our, uh, the scrutiny that's placed upon us and strive to enhance the, the service provision that we provide in the custody centres. Thank you. Mr White, do you have any comment on fit for I, purpose? I think the um, views of the people I represent would not necessarily be constructive um, because the people find themselves in those conditions um, under some strain and being, feeling very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, I think the ideal custody suite would be a very hard thing to define, but it's good to hear about the progress that's being made to try and improve the ones that are out there. Yeah. Um, can I ask why SPF and, and Unison had human rights concerns? What, what, what was the basis of, of that? Well, if, if I may go first, convener, sure. that the concerns are not around the facilities themselves. I've, I've made clear that where we, where we have primary facilities, the care that we provide for custody now is incomparable to the care that was provided in the past. And the staff that work in these centres uh, are doing uh, a tremendous job. Uh, and indeed to provide an additional level of assurance uh, when it comes to the inspection regime is that the SPF amongst others have appointed safety representatives and in conjunction with the service and also with uh, unions we undertake safety inspections of facilities where our members may be expected to work and that extends to uh, police cells also. Uh, so there's, there are continual checks on the quality of the uh, of the facility. There are others that aren't as good and for reasons that have been articulated earlier on they've been closed. Our concerns regarding the human rights come about moving people on long distances, in handcuffs, in cages or insecure in the back of police vehicles, uh, and what that might be doing for them. Because you know, regardless of why they happen to come into custody, the second they're in custody, they are vulnerable people. Uh, you know, they might want to, some of them might want to fight, some might have mental health issues, some might have psychological issues, uh, whatever that may be. And the, no, the notion and practice of moving people, and we do it almost every single weekend, from one holding centre to another, is in its own, in my, in my, my unprofessional view, but as an, as an observer, it seems to me a fairly inhumane way to be treating human beings is to clap them in irons, drag them across the country only for them then to be driven back uh, a day or two later by G4S in the back of another van. That to me just it doesn't sit right. Uh, now. Whether um, a human rights lawyer takes the view that that is entirely compatible or not, I don't know. But I feel that there is a vulnerability for my members and their health, safety and well-being, as well as the health, safety and well-being of the individuals that, the, that they're transporting. And that's where I believe uh, the vulnerability exists. And do you have a preferred alternative? What, what, would, you know, what, what would your alternative be to actually having to transport... In, yes, absolutely. Ensure the capacity and the staff are there that that doesn't need it in the first place. It's it's it's, it's, no, it's it's not difficult. Uh -huh. I mean, we I mean we, we're talking just now. I mean, we've we've only got to go back and look at some recent examples. You know, prior to 2013, Edinburgh, as I've, just because we're in the city here, had a number of police cells uh, across the city, uh, and. Uh, they, they dealt with their custodies in each of the particular areas. Since then, we're left with St. Le St. Leonard's. Uh, and St. Leonard's is now dealing with the custodies for Edinburgh and the capacity and throughput in a way that it was never originally designed to do. Uh, so that in its own right creates problems. And let me, and as you all know, uh, being uh, squatters in Edinburgh, at least during the week, uh, getting across Edinburgh is not an easy thing to do. Uh, getting across many of our cities is not an easy thing to do. Uh, so th these kind of things cause problems. We, we, there, are, there is talk about closing uh, our broth. Uh, our broth processes 2,500 prisoners a year. Uh, now, then you're looking at distances of 80 miles to Kitty Brewster, or you're looking at comparable distances to Dundee. These are long journeys. Um, so these kind of things in their own right seem to me that we're looking at it from the cash side rather than from the human rights side. And if we, the police service, have an absolute duty, which I think is right, to look after the human rights of individuals, then you as parliamentarians have to make sure that we're not hamstrung in being able to deliver that. And if that means that additional funding has to be provided for our estate through capital funding or through our staff through revenue funding, then that's an obligation that you have to discharge. Uh, because to my mind, the practice of moving people from east to west from, uh, say, St. Leonard's to Clyde Bank or to Cathcart or to wherever it's going to be, only then to move them back again, doesn't, to me, sit with the way we should be treating human beings. 
Okay, thank you. Would you like to comment, Michelle? Yeah, um, our comments was, not uh, you know, we are dealing with people that have very complex health needs, um, has been alluded to. Um, they are on occasions being transported around the country, but they're being transported to centres which are running short-staffed. These staff are under incredible pressure. It's rightly recognised custody is one of the highest risk areas within the force, yep. and yet we are not staffing that as we should be staffing that. We are putting staff under incredible pressure, looking after people with extremely complex health needs, asking them. Most PCSOs are working through their breaks to ensure that the service is delivered and that these people are looked after. And that is our concern. We're not... Something has the potential to go wrong because the staff are under so much pressure looking after increased numbers of prisoners coming through the door. Although the numbers in general are de decreasing, they're not getting that respite because they're getting more prisoners coming through their centre than they used to do because we've got less centres. And that is our concern. OK, thank you. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much, Kavina. I want to just ask uh, uh, a wee bit about uh, the process of the reception into custody. Now, the uh, Police Scotland evidence has given us um, a, a list of 21 questions uh, that form part of the risk assessment by the custody supervisor. Now, the, the, the first thing I come upon in reading the questions is the 20 out of the 21 questions, the second word is you. In other words, they're all questions that are directed by the person in charge of the custody uh, to the person who's been brought into custody. Um, to, to what extent are the people in charge of the custody making an independent assessment of the needs of the person brought into custody? Or are they simply relying on what that person chooses to say? Now, I recognise the evidence says if they basically don't answer, you flag everything as high priority. But I think there's probably some middle ground between that response, where people are responding, but you don't necessarily, and objectively probably shouldn't, believe the response you've been given. the case so you know for a number of reasons people might decide not to tell us that they have had a drink in the, the previous 24 hours it may well be for example that they are brought into custody for drink driving so clearly it would not be in their best interest to say that they have had a drink so you know the the custody sergeant and the pcso's will make an assessment on how they look how their eyes their pupils the smell on their breath and all these different assessments will absolutely be be made as part of a dynamic risk assessment in addition to that and it's one of the benefits of being a national uh, police force now is that we have a national custody system so if you, Mr Stevenson, happen to be locked up in Aberdeen one weekend and then locked up in Edinburgh the following weekend, the custody sergeant in Edinburgh has access to your notes and the files and the, the custody staff's observations of you when you were in Aberdeen. That was never previously available, uh, so that absolutely enhances. In addition to that, we have uh, adverse incident forms. So had you been in Aberdeen and attempted to uh, strangle yourself with your trousers whilst in the cell, that would be documented as per not just on the system, but as an adverse incident. And then when the next time you were to come into custody, then absolutely that would be highlighted to the reception staff and they would be made aware of that. In addition to that, you have the I mention a lot because I do think they're vitally important. Healthcare professionals, they have a national IT or a, an IT system called a DASTRA. So should you be taken to Inverness and the healthcare professionals put certain things on the Adastra system, then all the primary centres where we have healthcare professionals get access to that information in addition, because there will be occasions when custodies want not to tell the police something, but may tell the healthcare professional. So that's on the Adastra system, and the healthcare professionals can get access to that and can give us a, a gentle prompt in the right direction. The, the question set you know, was subject to significant consultation externally and in, internally with the prison service, with healthcare professionals, with lay advisors, with uh, independent custody visitors, and that was seen as being the, the best question set and the, the most professional and robust question set to try and elude the most honest answers from the custodies. But absolutely, we take on board that not everybody tells us the truth, and we need to use other things that I've described to try and enhance 
uh, our knowledge and the care plan that we provide for these people. Uh, just for the record, Superintendent, thus far <laughs> I have uh, denied myself the privilege uh, of your, your hospitality on the basis described, although I have visited the custody suite in my constituency at Fraserburgh on a number of occasions, but purely as an observer. I'm um, sure of that. No, uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me, however, just, and it moves on to the second part of what I want to ask, however, address what to me seems to be one omission from the list uh, of questions. Uh, which I would suggest might be, uh, have you responsibilities to other people? In other words, is this a, a, a person who's been arrested, brought into custody, who has young children at home who, 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 for whom that person might be responsible? Uh, have they an infirm parent, parent uh, or, or whatever that they may be looking after who's dependent on them. And I don't see that particularly covered uh, there. And let me just ask the other part of my question so that we can perhaps deal with it in a one uh, which is the more general point is just how do you deal with making sure uh, that other members of the family or partners or relevant people in that person's life are made aware of the detention uh, and indeed kept up to date on the process for what may happen after detention, such as, for example, being held for three days uh, for court on Monday. So, take the first question first. I think there's absolute validity in what you say. Question 21, that sort of catch-all, if you like, would would hopefully allude if there was a you know a parent that was brought in and kids were needing picked up from school or that I would hope that that would be that would be covered there or indeed I would hope that, that any parent guardian would actually would tell the police officers right away. But, ah, but wait, wait, do 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 forgive me if I just press it a little bit um, that 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 of course the person consent for example if they have two young children at home then, strictly speaking, they may not want to tell you about it because of a potential offence associated with their leaving these children at home. And, and I'm not entirely certain that question 21, while I accept it's a kind of catch-all, it seems more to be a question for the custody officers to themselves, perhaps, rather than... And, and people, when they're under stress, are not always going to think of these things. I th I, is that a fair comment on my part? Yeah, I don't disagree with that. And the, the second part, what I was going to say there uh, just before you came back at me was that actually I will take that away. We're, we are forever looking to improve this question set. This is just a moment in time. There are okay. best practice that we seek from elsewhere across the country, one being Newcastle. Actually, they have a, a further risk assessment model that we are looking to build in that will further enhance this. But I've taken a note of that, sir, and I will, I will take that back. Sorry, could you remind me what was the second It was point? really how you communicate with uh, important people in that person's life about what has happened and what is now going to happen. OK, so we, we really have to respect the wishes of the individual. Yes. If, if it's a child or a, a juvenile up to the age of it will be 18, year old, 18 years of age, full stop when the new act comes in, then we will tell a parent or guardian. But if it's an adult and they don't want any next of kin informed, then we don't tell them. That's the reality behind that, unless there are some really unique circumstances, significant mental health or appropriate adult, you know, something like that that may that we may uh, identify <coughs> from other, other research, then we might take the decision to do it. But as the norm, we wouldn't. But if they do ask us to tell them, then we will, the local policing staff will, or we will make the phone call or a personal visit. And if I, if I may, this is very important when we get to the transfer issue because, you know, the transfers have been a, a big discussion uh, and the submissions. But if we're looking to transfer an individual from Falkirk or St. <laughs> Leonard's to Falkirk or, or, or Falkirk to, to Greenock or wherever it may be, we, we do actually adhere to really strict criteria. So one is the custody is asked, do you want to be transported? And if they so, say no, we will look to to ask other custodies. And, you know, for this forum, very, you know, most times the custody does want transported because it gets them out of the, the cell and they're actually in a, in, a, in a vehicle for a period of time. So for them, it's actually a bonus getting a transfer. So, but we, they have to be compliant uh, prisoners. The, the whole investigative process has to be complete, so there is not going to be any further interviews. The decision has made that individual is going to custody, but the important one that's rele relevant to your point is that we phone the lawyer and ask the lawyer, or it, we tell the lawyer that our intention is to move this custody. Do they have any objections, i.e. 
is their intention to come in. And if they do, then we do not move them. We also tell the family, so you know, because family may want to hand in clothes or personal belongings. So we phone the family to say, it is our intention to move this individual tomorrow at two o'clock in the afternoon? Do you have any reservations or any concerns? And these are the sort of the strict criteria that we work to. So my basis and the basis of my staff is to be absolutely transparent and engaging with. The, not just the, the accused person, but also their family members and their lawyers before we make any decision to move these custodies anywhere. Um, sorry, could you... just the last, can I just, one last point about the, the custody numbers, which hopefully, the transfer numbers, which might just bring this to, you know, put it into and it's more the, the, the information get out I, because... I was wanting to just get the client's view from perhaps <laughs> from uh, m m Mr White, yeah. because we've had one view. I, I'm conscious of the clock view yeah, as absolutely. well. I think um, I would um, draw our attention to the Community Justice Scotland process, which requires consultation um, between statutory partners um, in every area, including the police, um, and also the fact that uh, people with convictions in the, each area are to be consulted about the um, design and efficiency of the services in each area. I think there is scope for um, some kind of additional consultation to do with the 21 questions, because I didn't hear people with convictions uh, being mentioned as the consultees. And I think we have a lot to offer in this regard, and it's something I offer. Um, we do this in other parts of the justice system in Scotland, and it would be something we'd be happy to support, because it's important that people do get a chance to contribute to things getting better. Many people who have been through the system want things to get better, so fewer people have to be punished. And that might be one way we can help. Just to make sure Ms McCardley hasn't had anything she wants to disagree with. No, I think the question set's been developed over time. Um, I think PCSOs become very good at um, dealing with people that they're booking in and eliciting the answers that they're looking for and being able to sometimes, shall we say, read between the lines. OK, and we'll try and move on quite quickly because we know there's chamber business starting at 2.30. John Finney. Thank you. Um, I think much of the, the substance of the questions I was going to ask has been dealt with, but I, I maybe just want to pick on one aspect um, um, that is in Mr White's submission and to, to, to ask um, Ms McHardy about this, and this was the community triage par, um, pilot, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde Police Scotland, um, GK and L divisions. Um, I don't know, Mr White, if you want to outline what you th thought of that process and if you would see benefits in an expansion. I think it would be tremendous if it was um, widespread across the country because I think it addresses the issues of, that have been mentioned already of mental health issues and addictions um, in behind offending behaviour. And I think the results that have been shown from that original pilot um, have led to it being introduced in a number of other areas already and it's taken as good practice and as a standard practice. And I think if we could encourage that across every police force and every area in Scotland, it would lead to a huge reduction in the number of people taken into custody in the first place. And it would lead to a lot of people getting help very, very quickly, rather than waiting in a police cell um, for something else to happen as things get worse. OK, thanks. Are, are you supportive of that approach, Ms McCann? I'm not familiar with that system, I'm afraid. All oh, right, no problem. I, w I wonder, Mr McEwen, is, is there plans to, to expand it? Uh, yep, they're very supportive of yeah. that. And there are there are a number of other really positive initi in initiatives, easy for me to say, ongoing across the country. Safe Space is one which is uh, exactly as we describe, or that's been described there, where people get access to a, to a mobile telephone in private and get to have that private consultation. There's stuff and work that we do with veterans. So if you've been in the armed services before and you're brought into custody, there's a support network, a referral network and a counselling network in place for uh, veterans, future pathways support, which is ongoing now across our custody centres, which is victims of child abuse. And there is a, a referral process and a signposting initiative in place there where these victims get the opportunity to get the support, get the counselling to try and prevent any reoffending. So there is a lot of good practice across the country. The one thing that we're trying to do now is we're trying to corral all that good practice into three strategic hubs that we're, we're piloting currently in, in Falkirk, Aberdeen and Inverness, and that's where the additional staff that, that Callum men mentioned is going to be invested in to actually test these uh, intervention processes. Um, pardon me. Um, I think that the 
concept of Community Justice Scotland as a non-hierarchical leadership team is one that we have to take on board here. And their primary role is to share good practice across the whole country. And I think it's very, very important that we take the learning that is within Police Scotland and spread it through all the other people involved in community justice and make sure that everyone gets a chance to contribute and participate in the process and to um, support the police in the work that they are doing to make sure that they can do more of the work they have to do on the streets and in other communities. Uh, can I just ask one specific of health care then, uh, uh, Mr McEwen, and accepting. If someone were to be locked up in Castle Bay and Barra, for whatever reason, then to get to the primary centre in that area, and I'm assuming that they would go to, to, to the one in the division, would take, I think, at least two ferries and some considerable length of time. I'm presuming that there would, I don't know, some in the local doctor if there were health care issues in, in any case. It's not the case that you're saying there will only be medical support in a primary location? No. So the immediate support would be with the local doctor and or you go to the local hospital. The issue with that or the, the long term issue with that as we find in places like Fraserburgh and Elgin is that sometimes the locum doctors are not available and or the, so if you take them to the local hospital the police officers and the custody can be there for a number of hours until they're seen. So the priority health care and the fastest and most e efficient is within the primary centres. Yeah, I, I keep giving these more remote locations, and you keep answering with more uh, what, what I would consider, you know, urban areas uh, uh, part there. I, I mean, what happens? Someone's needing to get the jail in Barra. Yep. They're locked up, and the storm's coming. What happens? Yep. So then the local and doctor, their head. the local doctor is is summoned, and he or she will arrive as soon as they possibly can. They may well, if it's something really serious, we would look to get an air ambulance out uh, and transport that individual to the nearest hospital if it's not on the island. See, one, one view of all of this is that, basically, we've moved to single service. A new plan's been conceived for, uh, for how custodies are treated, and it's disregarded what was good and accepted practice prior to that. Yeah, and I, I realise that's your point. I suppose the point I would come back to is that since the new service we created, there is only three centres in the north that has been shut. So the, the previous operating procedures in Wick and elsewhere are still in place. It's just the three uh, custody centres that I mentioned before that have been shut and no others. But they're not the same if you're having folk tied up for several hours taking them somewhere else. But they only get taken somewhere else if they're going to be retained in custody for a period of days. Well, if they're locked up on a Tuesday night, they'll pay the next lawful day at Wick Sheriff Court. So They would stay in Wick? They would stay in Wick? Yes. OK, I'm more confused than ever now, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add to that? Is that... I, 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 in case you think, convener, that I'm giving you the eye, I apologise. I'm, I'm, being, I'm, being I'm being blinded. No, uh, I mean, uh, to some extent, I, I absolutely agree with the point that Mr Finney is making. We, you know, health provision used to be provided, but in a number of uh, different ways. We've now moved to um, an approach where there is health provision within custody, uh, and that's resulted in a transfer of, um, actually a transfer of cash. We've also got uh, dedicated health staff, health professionals working in some custody centres, which in high volume areas is definitely uh, beneficial because we don't have, well, we don't have the sight and spectacle of queues of police vehicles waiting outside accident and emergency departments anymore. But I, yeah, we, I think to some extent we could, we can hybridise and look at what we used to do to see if there there are better solutions for some of the more sparse areas. Okay, thank you. If we can move on, because I'm conscious of the clock, we're aiming to finish about ten past. We've already covered um, the the concerns about the lack of PCSOs, um, 118 vacancies. So I, I would want some comment on that. But it occurred to me when I was looking at some of the submissions that the single force has uh, force has, has come up with a structure here of having a, a force custody inspector, custody cluster inspectors custody supervisors, and then somewhere down the bottom of the list, we've got the PACSOs. So I suppose my question is, are we a little top heavy there to the detriment of maybe putting more resources into the PCSOs um, who are obviously needed? Some views on that would be helpful. The structure that we have, it may sound a lot, but it's not, as we have five custody force custody inspectors and they work 24-7, so that is one inspector that's on 
for the entire of the country, and that inspector is responsible for not the not the hour by hour oversight and care and welfare of the custodies, but actually the the key decisions that are requiring to be made. You then have the the thirteen cluster inspectors and they're responsible for the supervision and the support of their staff but without doubt we have you know we have hundreds of pcso's and police officers in our custody centers and we only have a very small number of middle and senior managers so that was did you say 13 um custody cluster inspectors cluster, and then and five what about custody supervisors yep, how F many five FCIs, five inspectors. Force custody inspectors, yes. five. But what yeah. about custody supervisors? That's the sergeant. So they're at the primary centres. I, I couldn't tell you a number off the top of my head. I would predict, but I don't. Uh, that sergeant rank, maybe 90, but I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you. Quite good to get these figures. Yeah, I could certainly and do that. And the, the vacancies, 118 vacancies, because clearly we've heard evidence that's causing problems. So the, the vacancies... We are striving to fill a number of the vacancies currently, as, as Callum spoke about. He mentioned 50, but there's 45 new posts that were approved just last week. So that's 45 new posts that we're bringing in. We have 27, I checked this morning, 27 PCSO vacancies uh, in my division, and all of them are in, in transit through advert, etc., to get them filled. Uh, that does take a bit of time with vetting and interviews, etc., but that's 27. And then currently there's work ongoing that you that may have been discussed here before, that we are looking to reform the, the corporate services division, which is the, the back office, uh, college, Jackton, policy and guidance officers that do a lot of really valuable work but there was a decision by the force executive that we're going to release these officers and put them on the front line. And the decision has been made that 40 of those police officers will come into my division and work on the front line within the, the custody services. So we're moving police officers from the back office, as I say, doing support roles into the front line in the custody services. So in the last three to four months, convener, I have to say there has been some really significant positive traction and a momentum uh, around custody. And Can I ask how many vacancies that. there will still be then? You've mentioned 45 have been filled. What, what is the... So this is where it gets a bit... looking at 73? So, no, this is where it gets a bit messy, to be honest with you, and it's all to do with IT. But from the 1st of April 2017... The, and because of the available budget that was in place for police staff and police officers at that time, it was zeroed. So any vacancies from that moment on, we capture. So 27 vacancies that I spoke about is what we have in PCSOs. We're recruiting an additional 45. We're getting 40 police officers from corporate services division and also local policing staff have invested a significant amount of police officers in as well. Pre the 1st of April 2017, there wasn't the available budget in place to replace the PCSOs as they left the organisation. There was no budget aligned to those posts and those individuals were not recruited back into the organisation. And I think that's where we've got some concern because clearly they're, they're pivotal. To, to making the custody centres work properly. So perhaps there's decisions and um, a review of that to be looked at. Um, Callum Steele, is there anything else you want to say here? Again, I'm mindful of the time. I think it's really important to, whilst the terminology might have been zeroed, the vacancies that we existed were just simply deleted. The posts, mm -hmm. the posts were deleted. Uh, zeroed might be a polite way of describing it, but they, they, they no longer exist for vacancies. Uh, the, the issue of... I fully concede that there's been an awful lot done. No doubt about it. From where we were 18 months, two years ago, to where we are now, still uh, exponentially better, but still an awful lot more to be done, uh, not least because of the, the issue we have with, with officers transfer cr crossing the country with, with pr prisoners. But we have, we have, we have um, based, based upon years of experience, I think is the best way of describing it, we have some doubts whether these 40 officers from corporate services will be released. And that, those doubts are expressed by people, our members that work in the, the division uh, that Mr McEwen works in. And we also have, um, we, we also can't ex ignore the fact that taking 40 police officers from one part and putting them somewhere else is still backfilling. Uh, and whether they're supported from local policing or not, that's still backfilling. 
so that's police officers that are, that, that are not being measured as a cost because they're looked at in a different part of the budget. This is why the holistic approach and understanding as to the cost of provision of service is so important. Uh, and it's not Mr. McEwen's fault. You know, it's you know that's the that's the that's the partial he's been given, and he's the one he's holding in the, when the music stopped. Uh, but the, there needs to be a much more comprehensive appreciation that police officers don't have zero cost. An update on just exactly where we are. 118 um, PCSOs have gone, deleted, whatever, removed from the books, and some um, more. Um, some some kind of form of replacement is suggested. I think in in uh, towards the end of the year, when the actual final um, plan is looked at, could um, you have an undertaking from you, please, Mr. McEwen, to to send back into the committee um, exactly what has replaced these these officers, so that we can scrutinise that. And I think it's an issue that we will return to. I'm conscious of time, but very briefly, I, um, uh, Ms. Um, McCarthy, then I was very struck by the concerns that you raised, um, Unison raised about the future of custody divisions. Could you perhaps elaborate on that? Sorry, about the future of the custody division. I think it was in your submissions, um, inconsistency, a lack of continuity in con uh, custody suites, um, the number of officers coming in, about lack of training, uh, and probably uncertainty surrounding the future of police stations, custody centre. All of that seemed to be in your um, submission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just in relation to the fact that, you know, there has been the reduction of PCSOs that has been backfilled on by police officers. Um, it can be a different police officer on the Monday, different one on the Tuesday. So they're not there consistently. Custody is a dynamic environment. Um, you need to be working in it on a consistent basis mm -hmm. to be familiar. Processes yeah. do change. Yeah. We do continually improve and learn um, within custody. and. You know, I think you said there was a lack of inconsistency and lack of continuity yeah, in custody no, suite across Scotland. Um, yeah. Processes are consistent, but when you've got different people coming in, working for one day here and one day yeah. there, when the processes are changing regularly, they're not up to speed for what's changed from the last time they were there. So that puts added pressure on the PCSOs because they're needing to make them aware of the changes that have been done. There has been some work to address that and we are getting back full, but that's just putting a stick and plaster over the problem. So are there plans to uh, review the structure and role of the custody division? Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, so Michelle's right with her point. Previously, the, the backfill was uh, varied and disparate. But, you know, I would say now two months into a, a new model, we have seconded officers in place. So there is a continuity of the same police officers working in the centres now that was previously not there. So we are in a far better position now over the last two to three months than we were ever in before. In relation to the where is criminal justice services division, where is custody division going in the future? Yes, we have a plan. It will probably take more than seven minutes with due respect for me to tell you what that plan is and I'd be welcome to come back any time but we do have three pilots kicking off and like that information then Certainly. the, the, the committee fine. would be very grateful to receive it Ben just uh, quickly Mr McEwen could you please uh, clarify whether Police Scotland has received any formal complaints on uh, with regard to transfers between custody centres not that I'm aware of, no, and I did ask that question of my, my DCU this morning, just in case that I was uh, unaware of it, but no. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Camille. Are you? Nothing else to ask? Nothing in that else book? to ask. OK, Liam. <coughs> Thank you very much, and apologies for my late arrival. I was in the uh, chamber attending and participating in a debate. Uh, just before I turn to the question I was going to ask around the Criminal Justice Act, I'm just intrigued, following up on the questions that John Finney was asking, um, with the, the, the potential transfer of, of, of um, those held in custody some distances across the, uh, across the Highlands and Islands, what the implications are in terms of the, the prisoner transfer contract, I mean, presumably a fault to G4S to, to, to bring um, those back from, from custody perhaps in, in Inverness back to, 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 to Wick or Portree or whatever the following day. So, I, I mean, the implications one would imagine of, 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 of transfers of, of those, those sorts of distances are going to have a, a, an impact on the, on the contract. 
They do not in the cost of the contract right. because that was built into the contract. But you know, from the G4S submission, it does have an impact on on their resources. If I do just quickly just say the, the numbers, because I think I probably should have said these at the beginning, because it does put it in perspective, and it will just take literally thirty seconds. But in two thousand and thirteen, I, I got the four weekends of November because we don't do transfers during the week. So the four weekends in November thirteen compared to the four weekends that we've just had in November. So in two thousand thirteen, there were seventy nine in weekend number one. Now, weekend number one. This year it was 17. Weekend number two it was 46 and 13. Currently it was 16. Weekend number three and 13 it was 26. Weekend number three it was zero. And then weekend number four there were 66. And weekend there was 25. And that was a long public holiday. That was St Andrew's weekend. That's the reason there was 25. So the numbers that we are talking about 2013 compared to 2017 have reduced by 400% or so. We are striving to minimise transfers as much as we can. And your point might be about, you might come on to ask about the Act. I am convinced that when the Criminal Justice Act comes in and the presumption of liberation, that the transfers will hopefully be wiped out across the country. Yeah. The, the question of contract, I mean, mm -hmm. the contract that we have just now is the contract that we have. But I think we're kidding ourselves if a profit-making company is not going to look at its outlays uh, and factor that into what a future negotiation is going to be. Uh, and if, uh, and, and it's no if about it, they are. They are travelling much greater distances than I suspect were originally anticipated in the contract. That will be reflected at a future point in time. Uh, because, let's be honest about it, the G4S business model is not one built in benevolence. I'm involved in the, the negotiations for the new contract because it's 2019 that it's up and there are four companies involved and I, I don't want to, again, it's public just now, but we are involved in negotiation around cost and we'll see where that, that gets us. But Callum's right, part of the, the discussions will be around transfers, but hopefully the numbers I've spoken about in the new Act coming in, they are very, very small numbers compared to the 150,000 people that we bring into custody. I just... Just finally, I, mean, I, I think, Mr McEwen, you, you touched on it and probably gave an answer to it, probably worth um, inviting Callum to give his response. In terms of the Criminal Justice Act um, and, and the provisions coming into force uh, as of, of next year, uh, giving police officers the, the, the power of investigative liberation, uh, is the expectation that that, that will um, reduce, um, and if so, is there any way of quantifying uh, that reduction, the number of, of those going into, into custody um, and, as a result, potentially being, being transferred the sort of distances we've been discussing? I think it's the desire. Mm -hmm. I mean, like all of these things, the proof will always be in the pudding. Uh, what, what I think is expected also as a consequence of the new changes coming in early next year uh, is that there will be much greater throughput because of investigative lib during the day uh, where people are bailed to return to the police station to undertake f to be interviewed or for further things. And that, but that in its own right will create a, just different pressures in a different part of the system at a different time. Um, whether, whether we end up with the same people being held in custody or not actually remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the short answer is I don't know. We'll have, we'll have to see. There are, there are many plans and many concepts that have been developed over time that look fantastic on paper but don't work in real life. Uh, and you know, whilst everyone hopes and gets to the stage where we don't bring so many people into custody, to a large part, their own behaviours affect those decisions. In the I first was going to say, I mean, it, was, it, it, it seemed to, to to link back to the earlier point you were you were making about human behaviour. I mean, yeah. presumably, mix that with the the added option that's available as of of, of next year, and and while it may alter the the, the, the throughput. There's an additional flexibility that allow officers to take, and take indeed, decisions. indeed. And uh, but again, th this is this is where I think that looking at these things through a single lens is not particularly helpful. Public confidence plays a big role in this, and yes, it's going to be you know let's take a, a simple fighting uh, melee in the in the middle of the street. It's going to it's going to be entirely possible and indeed desirable and from a police demand and capacity point of view to take people into custody, allow them to calm down and then uh, release them for an, under bail for an investigative liberation. But then you've got to look at the public confidence side, who see these people that were fighting, potentially going back out, uh, and being under their nose in a v relatively short space of time, and how that then permeates into the 
the, the, the sense of confidence in the police to deal with things because let's be honest about it, most members of the public will not be aware or interested in the nuances of investigative liberation. They won't care that they've been taken to a police station, that there's going to be a process gone through, that there's been some kind of assessment, there have been some kind of conditions. They just see that they've been taken off the street by the police one minute and they're back out the next. Mm. That concludes our, our questioning. Can I thank the, the witnesses very much for attending? That's been a, an extremely worthwhile evidence session. That concludes the 19th meeting of 2017. Our next meeting will be on Thursday, 18th of January 2018, when we intend to have an evidence session on HMI Inspector <coughs> of Constabulary's report on undercover policing.